is the Roaring Elephant podcast for the 13th of February 2018, a podcast by the Patch and Hadoop and the surrounding ecosystem for anybody working with or investigating big data and advanced analytics. My name is Jon, and here's my co-host Dave. Hi Dave. Hello Jon. Welcome back to this second part of the second part of our Hadoop sizing story. Does that make it the third part? I, I think it means we're doing things in parallel or something like that. But, Ooh, uh, <laughs> oh, even worse. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, as our faithful listeners will remember from our last uh, uh, episode, episode 72, we kind of recorded a bit too much on the Hadoop sizing thing to spend it all in one episode. So we decided to split it. And uh, today you are the uh, lucky recipient of uh, the final part. And I can guarantee it's the final part this time of our Hadoop sizing discussion. Well... It's the final part until we do another part of it at some point in the future. Yeah, but that will be a reimagining thing. So that's going to be like a director's <laughs> cut. So that's different. Oh, okay. It's not a reboot then? Uh, no, that happens after the director's cut. Okay, okay. And then probably going to have to do some prequels first. Oh, really? Prequels? That sounds <laughs> that sounds awful. The bad, the bad old days of Hadoop. No, I don't want to yeah, talk about that. No. Okay, let's not talk about that. Let's go back to the things we recorded last time. So right. that people can enjoy the end of the story on uh, Hadoop sizing in this in this case in particular sizing of the compute parts. Enjoy. So these things also depend on the actual stuff software stack that you're talking about. So if you're doing a lot of Hive versus if you're doing a lot of Spark or a lot of HBase or a lot of Kafka. Um, then you're going to be looking at different node layouts. So if you're looking at Kafka, for example, you're going to want uh, probably a similar number of disks, but they're going to they're going to look slightly different. They're going to be mounted in a different way. They'll be accessed in a different way. Um, if you're looking at Spark, as we talked earlier, you, you maybe you, you want some SSD caching that you can use with an AP. Sorry, Hive even. Um, if you're looking at Spark, then your I.O. you probably care less about, um, but it'll be sort of standard HDFS underneath. Um, if you're looking at HBase, you know, these things all have different I.O. profiles, different I.O. considerations. And they further differentiate on how you use them. Yeah. Because, so. I mean, you can use HBase these days to do OLAP cubing on top of it to do SQL stuff. That's a whole different way of using HBase. And if you use it as a component in your streaming uh, solution. Yeah, yeah, indeed. In, um, the, in the olden days, it was pretty easy. Hive, a lot of disks. Spark, a lot of memory. HBase, both. <laughs> <laughs> Ka- Kafka, a lot of disk. Storm, uh, a lot of CPU. Disk, yeah, Storm a lot of CPU, fast CPUs, less CPUs with fast CPUs. Yeah, and uh, yeah, CPU maybe that's a good one to talk, to continue on, unless you have to, more to say about the stack stuff. Because I think stack the stack the software stack is just too too divergent. It's impossible to really predict anything unless you really know what a person is going to do with it. Yeah, work 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 with your work with your Hadoop vendor to give you a better idea of exactly component layouts, yeah. node types, and that sort of thing. This is where but the solution no, architect ain't, earns his money. It, it very much so, very much so. So I think, yeah, you're right. Let's let's start talking CPUs. Um, your little dual core out of a little t- tiny poxy uh, laptop, that's not going to cut it. But that's how everybody starts. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I think that's coming becoming less and less, actually. I think in, in sort of when we started, yeah, definitely, you'd, you'd see what you could spin up on a on a VM on your laptop or whatever, but... I see that happening less and less now with the the advent of cheap, affordable, accessible cloud services. I see more people doing stuff in cloud and less people trying to jerry rig single mm. node stuff on their own yeah, machines I, or servers. I, I think the security thing has become very important there because in the beginning, when people had uh, three, four laptops cabled together under a desk somewhere. And then started putting data on there. That was a, that was not secure at all, of course. And today in, in companies, that becomes a big no-no. Yep. People have gotten into their heads that data is important, expensive, and f- potentially very dangerous if you do if you lose it. So, I think that's a bigger reason why people now just go to a, a, a cloud solution or something like that and not go with uh, oh, I have some old hardware lying around. Let's make a Hadoop cluster. Yeah, which is a pity because I like doing that. 
Yeah, <laughs> but again, I think the 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 core concepts around uh, around Hadoop still 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 come true. Okay, you know, not not a bunch of crusty old dual core laptops that the the IT were about to throw out anymore, but um, you still don't need the latest, greatest, fastest billion core mm-hmm. twenty seven thousand gigahertz beasts either. Again, typically, and again, there's the always it depends, but <laughs> typically, more nodes is better. Um, more nodes with you know decent CPUs in them, but you don't need to go absolutely crazy. So you don't need the latest greatest. Um, yeah, biggest motivator here is the amount of CPU cores you'll need because on a typical class you'll have hundreds, if not thousands, of cores. If you yep. all for those take over the biggest, fastest, most expensive CPU, it's going to get hugely expensive. Your ROI and, will suffer. Exactly. And if you can add a couple more nodes with, sl- uh, with slower CPU cores, that will actually give you a better uh, performing cluster because you have more yeah. parallelism. And you've got more I.O. and mm-hmm. the li- life is just better. Yeah. Now, I wouldn't go for the for the low-cost uh, things either. I mean, Atom CPUs, they don't exist anymore. At least Intel has changed the way they work. But you still have these low-power, low-voltage uh, CPU things. Yeah. And they will work. I mean, I've got a little cluster here on my desk that works brilliantly with it, as long as I'm not too impatient. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, you get what you pay for. Don't go for the... If, yeah, I mean, I've actually seen in the past people go for low-voltage CPUs because it will draw less power and that will get it cheaper, right? Well, yes, but you'll be running a job twice as long, so does that really yeah. give you cost-effectiveness? Exactly. There's going to be a break-even point there somewhere, but basically, if you're looking at a Hadoop cluster at these kind of scales, then that's, yeah, in the margin, so I wouldn't really go there anymore. Yep. Now, one thing I do, I just see you, you crossed it out in our notes already, but uh, the multi-threading thing. What's your stance mm-hmm. on multi-threading? Good, bad, on, off? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've I've seen I've seen it go both ways um, over various generations of mm-hmm. hardware. I think today multi-threading is much better than it used to be. Mm-hmm. Um, it's I think now it's the sort of thing it is worth switching on, but you still need to be aware that it. You know, threads does not equal cores. Yeah, true. But I always uh, have it on these days and for a long time already because, I mean, I think it was, it's four years ago already, I think. There was one of those synthetic benchmarks you could run on, uh, on Hadoop and I don't know which one it was anymore. That actually gave me more than 100% gain when I put multi-threading on. Yeah. That totally synthetic and not real world at all. So don't even think you'll ever get that in real world applications. Yeah. But it did show me, okay, even in the worst case scenario, it can't really hurt me that much. And even if you only get 10% more, well, it's still more, right? As yeah. long as you don't get decreases uh, of speeds, and I haven't seen decreases in speeds in a not, long time. Not in these generations of hardware. I would definitely go for it. Yep, and agree. especially if you're in a virtualized environment, put it on. Because virtualization will definitely uh, take advantage from it. Yep. Okay, so moving from... Moving from CPUs onto memory. I mean, going back, going back a couple of years. I just ago. see what you put in the thing. <laughs> <laughs> so moving from CPUs onto memory. Um, a couple of years ago, if we were, in fact, we we have had this conversation a couple of years ago. So go and check previous episodes. But I think we would have, or I definitely would have said, um, you know, a standard worker node, you know, probably maybe 64 to 128 gigs of RAM. You know, maybe two years ago, that went from up to sort of 128, 256 gigs of RAM. I think now uh, the standard worker, again, it depends on your workloads. But mm-hmm. I think, you know, 512 gigs of RAM is, is starting to become fairly commonplace for um, heavy memory workloads. Um, the... We can you can really sweat that level of memory um, with an on-prem host with decent CPUs doing lots of Spark. Um, it, you can actually make use of those kind of um, considerations. But again, you need to also think about what's the what's the bang for buck you're getting for these yep. large memory nodes. So find find the sweet spot. Um, look at the cost per chassis. And then multiply that out by how large you think you might be, um, and then you know work out the the full 
you know, try and get an idea of what the full TCO is. Don't just think about the cost to buy the hardware. Think about the data center space. Think about the heat that they'll generate. You know, does does double the number of of smaller nodes actually just cost so much more to run over you know twelve months that actually it makes more sense to throw more money at hardware up front. You know, you you need to have the the full view of things. So it's very very easy to just look at the. Uh, uh, look at the hardware bill of sale for one node and think, yeah, that's fine, that'll do. But it, it's it's the wider picture. You know, if you're going to have 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, 50,000 nodes over a couple of years, um, there's some really serious considerations that organizations do actually really literally run out of space, data center space when they mm-hmm. go all in with with big data. And this is one of the major reasons that there's such a push to cloud because yeah. people want to just step away from a lot of these considerations and they just want someone else to take care of it. Yeah, when you say data center, data center space, you're not talking about cubic meters, but uh, power supply, right? Well, I mean, it can be both. No, Some, usually it's power. <laughs> well, it, it depends. So there are there are certain data centers, uh, certain very well-known data centers and hosting centers that are power constrained and in fact have been power constrained for the last probably 15 years <laughs> and they, mm-hmm. they they just keep um they just keep sort of decommissioning older power hungry stuff cramming in more efficient stuff and just they just about keep the balance that they can carry on, carry on operating there are others that are actually fine for power have plenty of power coming in uh, but actually just don't have the 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 physical uh, space anymore so Mm -hmm. i've never seen that happen right (laughs) well i was going to say i think you're right the power is usually the the consideration that most people hit but it's not always the case yeah because there's of course now the trend that all of the hardware is getting more and more power efficient so i guess we rested the curve there somewhere that they build bigger power pipes in the data centers and now hardware uses less power per per per, per chassis let's say so you can cram yeah. more chassis in so i guess i can see that happening but in my own personal experience i've always had to fight for power <laughs> yeah <laughs> up to the point that you had data centers full of half-filled racks yeah 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 and it, it still happens yeah. it's still <laughs> if you look at some of the uh the most uh, so the densest, and I particularly think of areas like in the in the UK in London around Canary Wharf. You look at the data centres there; they, they, they're all suffering from that. Mm-hmm. Like they've all they've all been power constrained for the last fifteen <laughs> plus years. But there are there are other data centres where that's never been the case. So it, it's again, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, definitely, mm-hmm. you know, speak to your data centre data center specialist. Uh, understand what the considerations are for your environments and be honest about where you expect the scale of this to go if things are successful. Because, you know, will you get space for half a rack of servers? Yeah, I'd expect so. Would you get space for two or five racks of servers? Probably. What about if you say we're going to put in 50 racks of servers and ideally we'd like it, you know, fairly mm-hmm. tightly co-located? That's probably going to require you know a longer conversation. So yeah, typically in those cases you'll be talking to the data center and they're building it and uh, buying <laughs> a floor. I, I've actually been there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not me too. For myself, but uh, now one thing I want to finish off with memory is mm-hmm. that. I think that's going to be your biggest cost concern anyway. I mean, I know we talked about cost not being everything, and that's true, but definitely at today's prices, memory is very expensive. Yeah. And it's going to be, I think, the... I was going to say the most expensive part, but I think there's one more expensive part coming up later in the conversation, but it's going to be more expensive than your CPUs and more expensive than your disks. But this is is one of these things that goes in cycles because i mean in fact we were talking about it just earlier when you know really ssds were were hideously expensive and actually memory at that time was relatively cheap Mm -hmm. and then we've we've had things kind of swing around now to be fair we've had you know faster memory has been slowly creeping out over the last uh, few years Um, we've seen memory speeds you know tick up a little bit um, and but the, the, the price, you're right. The price of memory at the moment, and this is obviously 
early 2018 uh, for anyone uh, listening to this a little bit later <laughs> is um, for the archaeologists is, in the year 3000 indeed is is actually you're right it's going to be one of the most yep. expensive components but i think that's also um exacerbated by the fact that we're now using more ram anyway you know things like spark being more commonplace LLAPs, caching layer, you know, all these other things um, in the ecosystem are far more memory friendly mm-hmm. than they ever were. So it's a combination, I think, of uh, we're using it more and it's more expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but so it's going to be a shift in how you design your clusters because when I designed these yeah. five years ago, then first thing you looked at was CPU. These days, uh, I set a chunk of money aside for memory first, and then look what I have left over. <laughs> <laughs> no, Although I in the cloud, it's, it's not a problem. It's all about a lot easier there. You don't care. Just make sure you have a lot of options. Yeah. Well, you you do care, and that comes down to instance sizes. But we'll get to that a bit later. Yeah, but the the clouds have also seen you've seen a lot of proliferation. Yeah, did I say that word correctly? Mm-hmm. Of uh, different um, layouts of VMs, because early days you had I don't know ten different sizes of VMs, and the more CPU power, the more memory you got. Finished. Yep. The end. More yep. cores, more memory. Now you see a lot more differentiation lot there, more where you can have uh, yeah. low core count, high memory, and stuff like that. All with the price attached, of course. Yep. Anything else on memory for you? Uh, well, yeah, I was going to talk about things. You can really go overboard here by adding PCI-based uh, memory uh, memory cards to increase that. That's hugely expensive. Mm-hmm. That uh, One of the vendors I used to talk to, I have no idea if they still exist, was violin memory. And when I laughed earlier, that's because I saw that they've changed it to tuba memory, which I don't know about. So you can explain more about that if you want me to, if you want to. But uh, on the one hand, when I saw those guys, there was a reason why they did that. But the reason basically was that they were trying to cram something into Hadoop that really didn't belong there. Yeah. I mean, it, it's directly against the commodity approach. Yeah, it's against the whole it? philosophy. It's just, it just doesn't, doesn't make sense anymore, I don't think. And if it ever did, probably not. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's, we, we've kind of touched on this a little bit. Um, but all of these things that you throw into your into your chassis, um, we've talked a little bit about power from from the data center side, and we power typically has a very close relationship to the amount of heat that these things uh, these nodes will start mm-hmm. putting out, um, and obviously. The amount of heat these things put out has a direct relationship to the amount of cooling that they need, which has a further relationship to the amount of power that this the whole solution will consume. The other thing, though, to think about with this is typically the more heat you have pumping through these things, even if you are able to somehow you know, keep the overall uh, data center cooler, you're going to see, um, especially if you have a large temperature differential differential in between the inside of the chassis and the actual um, data center itself, you're going to see increases in failures. It's just one of those, again, very close correlations. So there's, you know, data center design is itself has a you know a whole load of um, conversations around this, but it's. There's there's something about the scale of Hadoop that this always comes up, and it's always something that there's someone in the room usually that's got their eye on it, but it it probably doesn't always get the the full consideration that it should have. Yeah, it's also because uh, most of the times these clusters are being designed separate from the data center location. Mm. You, you 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 think about okay, this is the workload I want to run. I want to have these kind of performances, these kind of returns, these kind of wait times between my queries, things like that. So I need X amount of nodes. Nodes need to have this kind of memory, CPU, whatever. So yep, yeah, this is my cluster, and now I have to put it somewhere. Yeah, oh shit! Yeah, yeah, and that's the, it's really the wrong way to do it. You should have yeah. the the data center folks involved from the very beginning, exactly. so that they can give you. You know, they can give you a steer. I mean, you might want a particular spec, and it just might not be physically possible. So you may have to adjust that. Maybe you need to go more storage dense. Maybe you need to scale back. You know, the the overall plans of what you have to do, at least in the short to medium term. So, yeah, I think you're gonna have, yeah, go ahead. 
I think there's, there's, there's lots of considerations, but as with all of these things, communication is key. Getting all the people involved uh, and engaged up front. You know, no one likes to be presented with a, a fait accompli that they have no say in. So, again, teamwork, buy yeah. in, get everybody involved. And you'll have to talk to the data center people anyway for your networking, because they yeah. basically rule the in the the, the entry points and ex, uh, the, how they play they the racks, top of rack switches, stuff like that. You usually don't have that much influence on that. And the networking infrastructure is going to be important for your Hadoop cluster. And Definitely, it's, it's going to be important because often I would say it's different to what people are used to doing. Um, you know. Uh, a standard um, Hadoop environment is quite different to typical enterprise networking. Most people are used to um, just everything is connected to the corporate backbone and that's all they care about. Well, typically, you know, Hadoop clusters exist on their own, mm -hmm. completely separate, segregated networks, so they don't interfere with anything. And, you know, you expose the Hadoop cluster through a series of edge nodes or um, or proxy nodes or NOx instances or things like that, rather than just have them sit on the standard corporate infrastructure. So, again, just like the storage side, you'll have to bring your storage people along on this journey. They have to understand, yes, Network. in some cases we're talking about direct attached storage and not SAN anymore. And sometimes that's a bit of an education. And it's the same thing on the networking side. And this has changed because in the early days, your Hadoop cluster was a lot less secured. And if you had, I don't know, 100 nodes of a cluster interconnected very nicely and they were all able to talk to the external world and you did a disk CP, you kind of broke the whole network because mm -hmm. you saturated it. <laughs> yep. It's less of a problem now because security kind of forces Hadoop clusters to go inside a little yeah, firewall zone of its own with edge nodes like, like Nox and things you talked about. Mm -hmm. So it's less of an issue today. But if you have a intra-company network that ha does have full mesh um, connectivity, uh, be careful when you do ingest uh, into your Hadoop cluster. It can really consume a lot of network bandwidth if you're not yeah. careful. I mean, just... You know, very, very simple sort of guidelines on, on networking. Typically, um, 10 gig Ethernet is, uh, for on prem is just, is what you do. Yeah. Uh, you, dear God, never try using anything less than that nowadays. There's just no, there's no reason to mm -hmm. keep it as simple as possible. Um, try not to do lots of crazy dual homing and things like that. It, it, it's absolutely doable. Um, but it's it introduces, in my mind, a lot of relatively unnecessary overhead. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, yeah. do make sure you have multiple networks in your chassis because you want to have your data traffic going on one possibly bound uh, bound uh, network pair or something like that, yep. and have your logins and stuff like that running on a separate network so you don't yeah, interfere yeah. there. Yeah, very much so. But don't don't take it to you know really crazy extremes where you've got. But I want InfiniBand. Come on. <laughs> yeah, okay, so let's let's go there. InfiniBand. Um, <laughs> again, back when back when we were talking about one gig Ethernet and uh, and ten gig was out of reach of most people. Um, InfiniBand was also out of reach of most people, but in reach of some others. I'm not quite sure that makes sense, but that seemed to be how it was. And people were pushing quite heavily InfiniBand. Um, I don't think I've seen a single InfiniBand-based deployment for probably at least two years now, if not possibly a bit longer. Um, yeah, but that was basically because uh, Ethernet in those days only had the one gigs. You didn't have the 10, 40, and 100 gigs yet. And if you yeah. needed more than a gig, and some people did then InfiniBand was the only way to go, very expensive way to go. So now that the Ethernet gets a lot faster, it's not necessary anymore. But I do think it's we're going to see a resurgence of, uh, of InfiniBand stuff on Hadoop clusters because of the new Yarn and Docker and things like, yeah, well, real HPC workloads falling on there that maybe need intra RDMA connectivity, stuff like that. So today you're totally right. No, you don't see it in the future. I don't know. I'm not going to predict yes or no, but I wouldn't be surprised if I see a resurgence of having more of that stuff in your Hadoop clusters. 
And I know that on our end, uh, public cloud, we're actually looking at giving people the option of having InfiniBand enabled uh, VMs. Yep. So it is. It is there. Yep. Okay. So talking about um, yes, you strange esoteric hardware. <laughs> Um, so in the, in the good old days, when Hadoop Dave was, was basically, you had some memory, you had some CPU, you had some disk, you processed some data, life was good. Um, uh, really the, the world has moved on and we're seeing now lots of other considerations, um, you know, deep learning has, is bringing us the, uh, the promise of, uh, you know, real insights very quickly using uh, GPU power. And we're seeing organizations um, really doing this at some significant scale. I mean, Yahoo have been um, doing this well, uh, f- for probably a couple of years now based on some of the conversations we've had with them at various DataWorks summits. Um, you know, they've been doing some fairly serious cafe on Spark for a couple of years now. Um, and, you know, GPUs are starting to become more commonplace in chassis. And obviously that means, that means more power. That means uh, more, more cooling heat. required. That means a lot more expense. And we're, we're living in, again, 2018 for those people catching up, <laughs> um, is the year of uh, really scarcity of uh, high performance gpus it would seem at the moment um yep. lots of news articles around about how gpus are um even more expensive than usual because just no one can get hold of them it seems to be a combination of you know cryptocurrency mining and a few other things playing into this uh, this perfect storm of very high gpu prices right now yeah, of course, you know, we're not talking about the GPUs you'll put in your PC here. We're talking about the uh, compute GPU versions. So those are, <clears throat> are a little less affected, but they're still more expensive than they should be and lo- yeah, a lot more yeah. scarce than they should be. Yep. And apart from the real GPU parallel, parallel compute engines, there's also ASICs. Uh, I yep. know both Google and, and Microsoft are putting ASICs in their VMs specifically for neural networks and the artificial intelligence reasons. So... We'll see. I mean, A6 always makes sense when the GPUs are too expensive. And at a certain point when GPUs become less expensive, then A6 become too expensive and people start using uh, GPUs again. <laughs> it's the, the nice cycle. It's the circle of life, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, for me, it's the two of the same things because basically the lowest cost of both will be what you'll be paying. Fair enough. Just uh, make sure that uh, if you have these things, you know how to program for them because... It's still not easy. Yeah, yeah, and Getting there, but it's not a, it's not an easy button. You don't just plug in a, a GPU or an ASIC, and all of a sudden things go faster. It doesn't work like that. Yeah, your <laughs> Minecraft stays as slow as always. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, your Microsoft hat on again, hey? <laughs> yeah, well, Minecraft is. Uh, the, I mean, they got bought out, but uh, I don't don't see it as Microsoft. All right, continuing. We're almost reaching the end here, so we have some loose ends. Yeah, we do. Let's let's talk some more about storage because I feel like we've not really covered it. <laughs> <laughs> so ah. one of the things that we, we've mentioned a couple of times, and I'd feel very remiss if we didn't mention it again here, is uh, Hadoop 3 brings us the glory of erasure coding. So think of this as the next generation of storage tiering on steroids. Um, uh, So erasure coding, for those that haven't looked at it, HDFS erasure coding brings uh, the ability to effectively reduce the replication cost of HDFS from the the standard 3x down to about the 1.5x range. So, you know, 50% uh, reduction in overall overhead. The nice thing about this is it's absolutely perfect for um, archival tier. So you could look at using erasure coding. And essentially, erasure coding uses um, similar algorithms to those that are used within things like uh, RAID. And we've done a few um, sort of podcast episodes on that. In fact, we've had done a few pointing to uh, DataWorks Summit sessions that go into a lot more depth. Um, so if you think you're going to have 
a lot of data that you're going to be keeping for, for example, regulatory compliance reasons. You're not going to be querying it every day full out, full bore, but you, you, know, you need it to be accessible. You need it to be available. Um, erasure coding plus maybe archive sort of tier, storage tier and archive style nodes. That could be a very, very good um, mix for you. And I think actually, as we see this start to progress, we'll see people using erasure coding in ways that we weren't necessarily expecting mm -hmm. as the performance profile of it becomes better understood. But essentially, um, you burn CPU cycles in order to access erasure coded data. So that's your trade off. Yeah, I see one big good thing and one big bad thing in a simple in simplest forms that's uh, the bad thing is that your hfs tiering becomes more complex because you have mm -hmm. you don't have the three replicants where you can have one on ssd and two on hcd because you have less disks so be careful if you're doing if you're combining those two uh, the advantage i see is less disks means you can have sl uh, smaller chassis one u chassis typically don't work very well in the hadoop world because you don't you have no space to put your disks in Using erasure coding, less disks, less space required. So one use chassis do become useful. And if you're running against your sizing of the data center, then that comes interesting, both in cubic meters and power consumption. Because uh, well, one use chassis have less hardware in them, so they use less power as well. Yep. Though they're harder to cool, so. Mm. <laughs> All right. So moving from, you know, the core... The core data nodes, we say. Let's uh, let's talk about the edge. Oh God, the edge! You don't want to go to the edge. It's dangerous out there. Everybody wants to live on the edge. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but the view's so nice. Uh, depends where you live. Uh, the problem talking about the edge nodes is it's it's so chaotic. It depends. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, I mean, there's there's it depends and it depends. Uh, capitals. Fancy font stuff. Because on the edge, Line. yeah, I mean, you, you get different kind of edge nodes, right? You have edge nodes because you want to run a piece of software that's consuming stuff from your Hadoop cluster but still needs to be close by. And mm -hmm. in that case, your third-party vendor is probably going to be able to tell you, okay, this is what you need. And in those cases, often you're buying a kind of black box solution and you kind of have to believe them. If you're using the open source stuff, then you should be able to find enough information to figure out how to do this. And sometimes your edge node is actually an edge cluster. If you have a Kafka thing doing ingest, that's typically something you'll put on an edge node or edge nodes, and you mm -hmm. will get a little Kafka cluster there. So that's what I mean. It's such a divergent environment there. <laughs> yeah. But you brought it up, so what do you want to talk about? You've covered it all. I have no, nothing else to say. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, the edge nodes, I suppose the other category of edge nodes, again, we touched on it a little bit earlier, are things like access nodes like uh, like Knox that you would use for security. Yeah. Now, the nice thing about those is, you know, Knox gives you, uh, it's, it's essentially stateless. So you, you can put those, those can be very simple, very lightweight VMs. They can mm -hmm. handle quite a few. Or containers. Um, yeah, VMs or containers, they can handle quite a few uh, connections on not a lot of resource. Mm -hmm. They're perfect to spin up. Yeah, you know. it helps a lot with uh, load balancing and stuff as well. Spin up yeah, a couple yeah, more, yeah. kill a few off, you don't need them. Yeah, either, either use sort of um, mm -hmm. open source load balancer within that, so something like HA Proxy, <laughs> or if you've got a corporate load balancer solution, F5, Big IP, whatever. Yeah. Put, put some of those in front. It's a nice example where you have the, the hybrid situation where you have both an on-premise hardware-based, chassis-based uh, Hadoop cluster, but still be able to benefit from virtualization by putting these kind of edge things on a virtual environment for ease of use, scalability, security Very perhaps. Very much so. Yeah, definitely. Uh, 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 things like Ambar, you also typically go on an edge node, your management uh, compute, um, that happens there as well. I'm assuming that that's going to change a little bit with uh, Yarn being Docker-aware. That things that used to live on the edge can now live inside a yeah long lived service inside a Docker on Yarn solution, and it's pretty much going to be a question on how much resource contention you get. If it's a little website that takes no resources at all, then it doesn't really matter where it runs. If it does kind of steal resources when it gets used, then you have to be careful it doesn't uh, yeah uh, intrude on your production flow, of course. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so flowing on from the story of uh, edge nodes, which tend to be the sort of the method that the majority of data will come in and go out, depending on how you define an edge node. Um, so data ingress and egress and IoT event streaming and things like NiFi and Kafka. I mean, things it, like Scoop and Flume. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me. They're all just they're all just edge node services. Mm. They they may well live on different specifications of edge nodes, but they're all just different types of edge mm. nodes in my in my very yeah. limited uh, view. Of this. Uh, what's your philosophy behind it? Would you take one big edge node and have multiple things running on there, or have every edge node only doing one specific task? Uh, uh, it depends. <laughs> It, 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 I'm so trying to reason, get a real answer out of him, people. I'm really trying. I know, I know. And I'm resisting because that's what I do. Uh, but no, so the reason I say it depends is because like, uh, you need to understand what your, uh, what your throughput is going to look like. I mean, if you've got a relatively small environment and a relatively small you know, set of input and output requirements, then sure, you know, lump it all on uh, you know, a pair of nodes and and sort of uh, round robin between them or, you know, fail over active passive between them. But uh, most of the organizations I'm dealing with are talking about, you know, up to petabytes a day in some cases of stuff streaming through. And you know, you're not going to get all that on one node. Mm-hmm. So um, it, it really depends on the scale at which you're talking about it. I don't think there's a, there's no fundamental issue with putting lots of different ingest stuff on a smaller number of nodes, as long as it's appropriate for the hardware that you've selected. Where people get into problems uh, always is where they think they can cram more stuff onto smaller nodes, and it never ends well. Like People have problems with edge nodes going down, and then, oh, God, we can't get data into our environment. Well, mm-hmm. why not? Well, because our edge node has gone down. Yeah, and don't forget your high availability <laughs> environments as well, because when something goes Always. down and then you have to go to your slaves or your passive standbys, yep. oh, those can be 10% sized of the original ones, right? <laughs> we only need, we only, you don't need them anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's I mean, awesome it, one. Exactly. Classic classic examples of people doing it wrong. Um, <laughs> but then if, if everybody did it right in IT, we'd be out of jobs, so we can hardly complain too much about that. Nah, we'd um, find something else to make complicated. <laughs> Oops, I said it out loud, didn't I? <laughs> Possibly, possibly. In your case, it's probably audio recording. But anyway, oh. <laughs> um, so there's, there's, it, it's fine to have multiple ingest services on single pieces of hardware or pairs mm-hmm. of hardware in most cases, but make sure it's appropriately sized or scaled. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah for me, it's resource contention, which you talked about, yeah, and secondly, absolutely. security. Yeah, because some things definitely. just don't belong together. Yep, yep. And make sure your HA survives it. Yeah. Yeah, and active passive is fine. There is no need for everything to be fully, um, you know, fully highly available distributed all the time. For a lot of people, active passive works just fine. is significantly easier to administer. is also uh, a lot cheaper to to run and deploy and manage and. Yeah, you know, well, don't be afraid. Especially in a cloud environment, passive. because in a cloud environment, your passive can actually be non-existent. Switched off. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Well, you just say. Make sure you can just spin it up when you need it. Yeah. Everything, your computer, the theme, all your storage needs to be there or needs to be replicatable in a yep. short amount of time. But your your compute can just be yeah, a Jenkins script waiting to to boot up your cluster. Indeed, or your automation of choice. Mm. <laughs> So when we've been talking about all of this magical hardware, we are primarily, whether we're talking on-prem or cloud, we're primarily talking about x86 hardware, Intel or AMD. But that's not your only choice, is it? True, true. And as a, as a big example of how Dave and me differ in how we think about <laughs> things, uh, Dave's example of an other architecture was the IBM Power, and yeah, mine IBM was the Raspberry Pi. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, two very different ends of the spectrum, and yeah. uh, both actually quite amusing. But there we go. I mean, for me, if you're looking at um, IBM Power, there are some there are some fairly interesting sides of it. If you're if you're obviously a big IBM Power um, 
sort of customer today and you're looking to get into big data, it's obvious to go and look at IBM Power for your big data mm, platform. Yeah, maybe. Um, if you're sort of brand new to big data and you're a big IBM customer, then maybe IBM have some, well, I know they have some very, very good incentives right now, um, you know, 3x performance guarantees and things like that, that if they if they don't meet, then you get your money back, sort of that sort of deal. Those sort of conversations can be had. So uh, it's looking quite attractive right now. Would I probably go down that route? Uh, I, I'm a long time X36 person. That being said, um, you know, I'm now working for the third organization in a row that uh, has gone through um, providing software on IBM Power. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's 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 another option. It's another architecture out there. Yeah. And as Jon will now tell you, you, you could also run your entire enterprise big data platform on Raspberry Pis. Go ahead, Jon. <laughs> uh, yeah, you could actually, but I would never do it, and I would never use an <laughs> IBM Power either, personally, to be honest. And the reason for me is vendor lock-in. And I'm not mm. talking about the fact that you're an IBM customer and IBM has a vendor lock-in there. I mean, it doesn't matter where you buy your stuff, they always have some kind of vendor lock-in there. I'm talking about the lock-in on the platform. The whole Hadoop thing is being developed on x86. Mm -hmm. That's where it all exists. The reason that I have my self-built cluster on my desk here not being Raspberry Pis, but actually being uh, Atom-based uh, Intel CPUs is because I didn't want to be in the situation where I needed ARM software. Because mm -hmm. I either have to compile it yourself, been there, done that, not doing it again, yep. or you're dependent on the people that are supplying that software. On the Raspberry Pi or any kind of ARM solution, you're depending on the people that are nice enough to do the compilation for you. On the IBM Power, you're dependent on IBM having the software compiled for your platform. And or your Hortmux miles or, or Hortmux or whatever. I mean, Hortmux does this because IBM is giving them an incentive to do so. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's extra work. Nobody does work if they don't get uh, some kind of recompense for it. No, I do it for the love. Uh, yes, except Dave, but we all know <laughs> Dave is strange. This is also true. Uh, good morning, Dave. Uh, but see, that's for me a kind of attachment that I don't want because this is all open source. It's coming from an x86 environment. I don't want to leave that and potentially be get into a situation where that one little add-on nice to have indispensable thing from open source I can't have because it doesn't have compiled versions. And in my environment, I'm a company, I'm not a DIY hobbyist. It mm -hmm. needs to be coming from a Red Hat repository or a Debian repository, a something that has sustainability behind it. Sure. So it's starting to do these things yourself. And that's what makes me a little bit scared to actually go to other architectures. The only reason I would go for it is that, uh, well, Raspberry Pi, if, I, if it's only, the only thing I can afford, then maybe I should, but... Maybe it should be think. <laughs> and IBM Power, if you, as you said, you have a lot of it already and you have people that know how to work with it and everything's in place anyway, then yeah, you're making it more complicated by not going there at that point. That being said, I'm sure IBM also has non power uh, architectures they might want to sell you as well. Absolutely. If you go into a cloud environment, it's a lot easier because cloud is just virtualized. You don't care. But it's also. All x86? I'm trying to think now if there are any. Well, the virtualized CPUs are 86, but yeah. you don't really care. Because basically it's the hyper layer that on top that makes sure that it works what it is. Because we also have Cray computers now in uh, in Azure. Mm -hmm. But on the virtualization layer, you can virtualize whatever you want as long as your hypervisor can do it. So this kind of really nicely leads us into the glorious world of reference architectures and when i wrote this down this little note that i'm thinking about now i actually said uh think about the reference architectures from hardware vendors but of course the reference architectures from cloud vendors in fact you know all big data vendors in this space um one thing i would guide is use the you know look at a variety of different reference architectures you'll start to see common patterns you'll also start to see things that maybe only one particular vendor does and you should probably query why they do that and they may give you very good reasons for doing it that way but use the you know use a variety of reference architectures across you know hardware vendors and cloud vendors 
Um, use them for inspiration. Use them for guidance. But don't necessarily think that that's the only way to do it. Um, in many cases, the hardware vendors may well have a vested interest to a particular architecture. Maybe you know, maybe you can use that to your advantage. Maybe if there's there's some sort of new, maybe slightly less proven environment that they've just sort of made available maybe you can get great discounts on that and you know yes you'll probably need to agree to to doing a sort of a, a case study or something like that but often that's a great way to you know reduce the cost of your initial uh big data program i've seen some very successful negotiations uh <laughs> gone down that particular route but as i say Look at them for inspiration. Don't be a slave to them. Don't think that's the only way to do it. And also, you know, make sure you compare and contrast and make sure you're getting uh, the best deal. And again, as as Jan was saying earlier, also make sure it fits in with your whatever your corporate um, sort of preferred hardware vendors are. You may be able to introduce a new one for a big data platform. I have seen that happen before. Um, but in many cases, you know, your organization will want to continue using the same sort of one or two vendors. And so you'll, you'll automatically be cut down to a, a subset of what, what's available out there. And sometimes that's also fine. Vendors mm. have multiple tiers of hardware. You may start using a slightly different tier of hardware. So, um, you know, Im- what immediately comes to, to mind is sort of, uh, HP, for example, with their sort of standard DL series of, of enterprise grade servers. And then they've got their Apollo servers, which are more of the, the scale out hardware. That's those sorts of things. But you see these things across all the different hardware vendors. So just using that as one particular example. Yeah. And in the best and ideal world, all the reference architects should be similar to each other, basically. The biggest thing to take to, to take in mind is it's a reference architecture which is meant to be representing a generic Hadoop cluster because the hardware yeah. deliverer, larva, hardware live, uh, person doesn't know what you want to do with it. He doesn't know if you want to do machine learning or if you want to do SQL, but they still are being asked to deliver reference architectures, so they have to make mm-hmm. them, and they do. And again, it's a nice place to start from, but it's a basis to build upon dependent on your environment, what you want to do with it, cost whatever the restrictions on data centers every Hadoop cluster that I know of is really bespoke yeah, and your hardware yeah. yeah. should also have that in it and again that's where your solution architects that's where your experts that's where they gain their money and and don't be afraid to ask for examples of so who's running this particular sort of style reference architecture today you know mm-hmm. don't be afraid to ask for those references have those conversations with people that are doing it yeah. what did they find works what doesn't work so what well what would they have done differently today exactly exactly you know learn from other people's mistakes always always and allow other people to learn from your mistakes it's a two-way street people it is it absolutely is and that's why you know that's why we're in this is to to share that knowledge about things that we've done things that we've done that worked well and things that we've done that maybe didn't work so well that's why we do the podcast, isn't it? Because we've made so many mistakes in our lives. Yeah, we definitely don't want to make the same mistakes that we've made. Dear God. <laughs> well, on that note, it's really all the time you have for today. We hope you enjoyed this survey of Bite Size Big Data. We'll be back next week with a new episode. Until then, please go to www.drawingelephant.org where you can find more information, including a feedback form. You can find us on Twitter using the at Hadoop, uh, at Hadoopcast tag. I shouldn't talk so fast. And you can contact us by email to podcast at rollingalpha.org. Send us any thoughts, comments, and feedback. Until next time, my name is John. And my name is Dave. And we look forward to talking to you next week. Goodbye. See you then.